And after you'd wake them up, I'll still use the illustration. And as you would wake them up in the morning, I'll, I'll be there in a minute. And then they would roll over and go back to sleep. And it wasn't much longer, about 15 minutes later, come on, it's time to get up, time to go to school. And it's usually the first week of school when this happened. And say, I'll be right there. Okay. And finally the third call, you got five minutes to get cleaned up, to get dressed, get your breakfast, and get to school. Let's go. It is time to wake up. I believe that as I look at events in our world, and as I look at the prophetic timetable of God, it's time that you and I wake up. It's time that we stop our sleeping and that we wake up. Because of the lateness of the hour. I understand when I was in Bible college, I was able to wake up, get, get cleaned up, get dressed, and get to chapel in about 10 minutes. Um, it didn't take me long to get ready to get going. And part of it, I worked at a, 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 a factory 40 hours a week, and so I didn't get home till like 1 in the morning. And uh, chapel was at 9 o'clock, and um, uh, so I would get my sleep. I'd be up till 2 or 3, you know how it is after you get off work. Um, and so I learned that I would be ready immediately because the hour was late. My wife used to laugh, weather like this, my hair would be frozen solid. When I got into chapel, she'd sit there, we were dating, and she would just tap on my hair. <laughs> Beloved, there's some things we need to do because the hour is late. And today I want to share with you three things. We need to live more faithfully. Secondly, we need to witness more fruitfully. And thirdly, we need to exhort more fervently. As you read Romans chapter 14, the Bible says, knowing the time, that it is high time to wake up from our sleep, to get up from our sleep. There is a time when we can wake up slowly there is a time when as followers of Jesus Christ, there was a time, I think, where we may not have been so into the time frame in which we lived, but that time is now past. Because I realize this, Jesus is coming again. That is an undeniable fact that you will never explain away. We don't know when. The Bible says we are to be ready because the Lord comes at an hour that we do not know. We are to be ready. And I realize this. If the time is already set by our Father in heaven and the plan is already laid out by our living God, I'm a whole lot closer to that time than when I was first saved. I've had more winters go over my roof and now on my head and my beard then I'd like to, to, um, to admit. But I also realize that we can be cynical about the Lord's coming. We have people that have gotten cynical about the Lord's coming. But beloved, it is time we woke up. Too often the church is asleep. Too often those of us who are following the Lord Jesus are sleeping. And it's time to wake up. It's time to quit playing patty cake with the world. It's time to quit running with the devil's crowd. It's time to quit living the way that the world lives. And it's time to wake up. And that's what the scripture says here. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I sometimes get a, a kick out of the way people go shop, especially at Walmart, okay? I, I better be good here. My daughter used to live on the inside of Des Moines. She used to mention going to the Altoona Walmart. And I guess that's um, uh, from, according to my daughter, Redneck City. 
And she said, I used to go to find out what kind of new flannel pajama bottoms were coming out, which was in vogue. Because all too often, there are people who go shopping in their jammas. Okay. Um, now, listen, if you shop in your pajamas, I'm not here to judge you. Okay. But I'm sitting there. I was taught that when you get up and you go out and you greet the world, you dress a certain way. And one of those ways is not to wear your pajamas. That you don't go out in public in your pajamas. Um, although I used to take the dog out wearing my pajamas and my slippers. Don't judge me now. <laughs> but you know, if you're up for the day, there's a way you dress. If you're up for the day, Christian, there's a way out of dress. That means that there's some things you need to get rid of. Some things to take care of in your life. Some things that we, we need to cast off the works of darkness. See, I lived in darkness for a while. I knew what it was like to live in darkness, to live my life not worshiping the Lord, not glorifying the Lord, not living for the Lord. I live for myself and the next high and the next drunk I could involve myself in. Look at what the scripture says. Walk properly. Not in partying, that's revelry, and drunkenness. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. God's telling us that if we are ready for Jesus' soon return, we're going to get rid of some things in our lives that need to be gotten rid of. Some things that don't honor God. Some things that, that are detrimental to our spiritual life and to our witness. In fact, the Bible tells us there's some things in your life that just don't belong there. And maybe you've got that in your life. Maybe you say, preacher, there's some things I need to get rid of. Just need to get rid of them. Just, and, and I notice that the scripture talks about casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. You see, we are seen as soldiers that have the armor of the Holy Spirit on us. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. And the Romans 13 calls it the armor of light. Not only are there some things we need to get rid of, there's some things we need to put on. There is some armor that we need to be dressed in. And rather in the sinful life, we are to put on Jesus Christ. What you say you believe ought to be reflected in the way you live. In fact, I, I, I am positive that you can say whatever you want about your love for Jesus and your love for God and your love for the, for the Lord and the Lord's people, the Lord's house. Let me look at the way you're living. I'll tell you who you love. See, we have in this society some kind of a disconnect between what we believe and the way we live. The Bible doesn't have that. And you can tell me, I, listen, I have people tell me all, all the time how much they love the Lord. I had a guy two years ago tell me how he was a believer, how he was a Christian, and he was pulling for our motorcycle ministry. And so this year I asked one of his associates, I said, is this gentleman living for Christ? He tells me he's a Christian. He tells me he loves the Lord. He tells me he, he wants to follow the Lord. And I said, let me ask you a question. Just you and me and, uh, and the um, trees out here. Is this gentleman living for Christ? And he just stops. He doesn't say a word. He just shakes his head. No. And then I said, so do you think he loves the Lord? This guy's just recently come to faith. He said, probably not. You can tell me what you believe, but the biggest problem with Christianity today, the biggest problem with the church in the world today, is that we say we believe one thing and we live completely different. We say we love the Lord Jesus and we are hateful and mean. 
We say we love Jesus and we're all self-centered and it's all about us and it's about our things and our stuff and our money and I can keep on going, can I? If you believe that Jesus is coming again, it will change the way you live. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and I think to set the verse up to get us in contact, I'm going to read in verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. But beloved, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. A lot of discussion about what heaven's going to be like and what am I going to look like. I don't know what I'm going to look like. Maybe I'll be six foot five. Wouldn't that be great in heaven? Doesn't really matter because I'll be able to, you know, do whatever I want to. And that part of that's pleasing Jesus. But we talk about, um, St. Augustine had a book called The City of God. And one of the questions he posed is, if I'm fat down here in heaven, will I be fat, or down here on earth, will I be fat in heaven? You know, when I read that, I thought, does it really make any difference? The answer is no. But I know this. The Bible tells me that when Jesus appears, when the clouds part and I'm taken to be up with him, I shall be like him. My body will be fashioned like Jesus' body. I will have a glorified body. And then it goes one step further and says, and if you have this hope in you, you will purify yourself even as Jesus is pure. The person who is expecting Jesus' soon return makes sure that their life is living according, or lived according to Scripture. We need to live more faithfully to the Lord. There's coming a day that when Jesus returns, Everything I have in this life is going to be burned up. It's always um, uh, fun to tell somebody, you know, when they're, they're real proud of their possessions and their stuff. And then you just say, yeah, it's going to make some pretty fine ashes someday, isn't it? It's going to burn up. You see, nothing we have in this life will last. Nothing that we have set our hopes and our dreams on as far as this world is concerned none of it will last everybody's into the tiny homes you know I don't care about a tiny home I got a mansion for me prepared in glory I don't care about the stuff in this world I got a place in glory and I realize that if Jesus doesn't come, I can still be stand before him today. All you need to do is break out your newspaper and start reading obituaries. All you need to do is start looking at funeral services on the internet. And you realize there were a lot of people on that list who today are lying in state but they had already had plans made for today. There are all kinds of people who passed from this life into eternity that already had plans made for tomorrow. I've got plans made clear up until right now, until September. But I also realize that at any moment, I could stand before my Savior and all those plans are gone. You see, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to realize that my life is so short. Oh. 70 years? 80 years? By the way, 
70 is a lot younger than it ever used to be. Amen. Amen. 90 years. If you live to be 100, it's still just a drop in the bucket. You know what a drop in the bucket is, don't you? Fill a bucket full of water. Fill it all the way full of water. You put one more drop that makes that bucket overflow. That's a drop in the bucket. It doesn't amount to a thing. Not when you got millions of drops in there. I believe Jesus is coming soon, and because of that, I believe that I have to live for God in a greater way than I ever have before. I need to live more faithfully to my Lord than I ever have before. I need to dedicate my life to Christ in a way that I've never done it before because the day is coming when I will stand before the Lord Jesus. You know, I shared with you some of the blessings of our trip in South Africa. One thing I, I think I shared with you, maybe not all of you, was one bad thing that happened. When our teenagers, our ball players, are walking to the ocean front, they're walking to the port, main drag in town. And as they're walking, a gentleman, they drive on the wrong side of the street there too. I, I, I almost got hit because I'm looking this way and I'm crossing it and the car is coming from this way. So I understand that. This guy running across the street, hit by a car and one of our coaches who's also a police officer pulled the kids away. One couldn't take it and he said, that boy's dead. There's no doubt in my mind he's gone. He ran across the street because he had some kind of a plan to get on the other side of the street. Maybe it was buy something. Maybe it was to get supper. Who knows? But he is immediately plunged into eternity. And if that can happen to you and me, we need to be ready to stand before the living God today. And that means I need to live my life more faithfully for him. I also believe that since Jesus is coming again, I need to witness more fruitfully. Would you look with me at 2 Peter chapter 3? Verse 3 says, I'm going to read verse 1 because it, it all fits together. Beloved, I now write you this second epistle in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. So I, I want to stir you up. I want to get your thoughts stirred up. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of, our, of the Lord G and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a, as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You've got scoffers, don't you? They've been talking about that rapture thing for hundreds of years. It hadn't happened yet. You, you've heard the scoffer, haven't you? you? You've got people thinking that, that Jesus is coming. I haven't seen it, and I've lived a long time. And they go on and on and on. And they don't realize God's timetable. And sometimes Christians help the date setters, or help the scoffers by setting dates. Well, I have preachers who set dates of Jesus coming. I need, they need five minutes in my office with me and no witnesses. Okay? <laughs> I really wouldn't do anything violent to them. I'd beat them with my Bible. <laughs> but you realize that those who set dates 
make those of us who believe that Jesus is coming soon look really stupid. I still remember in 1977, I was working at Dyco, working in the break department. That, it, that didn't mean the coffee break department, okay? We made breaks. And a book came out that said, I think the guy's name was Weissnot. 77 reasons why Jesus will return in 1977. And it was supposed to be something like September 15th. I don't even remember the date he gave. But I still remember working, a bunch of, working among a bunch of guys who were not believers, and they were getting a kick out of that book. And one of them brought into work that day, hey, look at this, preacher boy! <laughs> and then one of the guys said, hey, we'll see you on Monday. Oh, we won't see you on Monday. You're going to be gone, aren't you? And I had to go to work that Monday. Because some goofball said Jesus was going to come that Saturday. And so there's a cynical response to their teaching. And here's my response to them. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. God hasn't forgotten his promise to return. But he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And my answer is this. The only reason the Lord has delayed the coming of Jesus is to give you one more chance. One more day. You see, after the rapture, there will be millions screaming for one more day, one more opportunity. Today, hell is filled with people who are screaming, oh, if I just had one more chance to hear it, I'd respond. But they won't hear it. They won't get it. They'll not have an opportunity. The only reason that Jesus has delayed his coming is because of the Father's heart. He is not willing that any should perish. Now, if that's God's mindset, which it is, should you and I have any different a mindset? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Word of God says, if I can get my pages turned, that the love of Christ, verse 14, the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Verse 20, we then are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Not only has Jesus delayed his coming to give an unsaved person one more chance to hear, he has delayed his coming to give me one more chance to tell them. The opportunities I have wasted. Talking about weather and road conditions and motorcycles, and I understand you gotta do that, but neglecting to tell them about Jesus. If I love my fellow man, then I realize that it is Jesus' love that compels me, constrains me, drives me forward to witness for those who are lost. A couple years ago, I was with my brother, Denny Reese. He's planning to come here for our motorcycle Sunday. I'm going to be having good testimony. You got to know Denny. He's been here. He's visited here. Denny and Michelle. Um, we were in a Hardee's restaurant in, I think it's either Hattiesburg or Jackson, Mississippi. I can't remember which one it was. We went to get ice cream, couldn't find the Baskin Robbins, so we ended up in a Hardee's. He hands Trent a pack of tracks and said, and he looks at me and I said, you ready? 
Just, yep. He sends Trent all around the restaurant and give a gospel tract to everybody. And he stands up, then he does, and preaches a simple gospel message to everybody. This is a busy, um, uh, busy Hardy's restaurant. I heard one of our other people, I won't give his name. That guy must be nuts. And I said, I hope I'm crazy the same way. You know why Danny does that? Because he knows what it's like, he knows what it's like to be lost and controlled without, by alcohol and drugs. And he loves people so much that he tells them about Jesus. God has called us to carry the gospel to the lost. You cannot read any of the gospels. You cannot read any of the scriptures, really, and say, I don't care whether people get saved or not. I'm into my own world. I'm doing my own thing. Mark 16, 15. Jesus says this. It's in red letters in my Bible. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have been given the responsibility and authority to share the gospel with the life lost. When somebody says, what gives you the right to get into somebody's world and to get into their face and tell them about salvation? You know how you answer them? Jesus did. He told me I have to do it. So I've got to do it. Sorry, that's who gave me the right to get into your face and get into your world. Because Jesus is coming again. We need to be witnessing more fruitfully. I have found that when I bear fruit is when I plant the seed. I think I still have some garden seeds in my garage somewhere among all the other junk that I've got there that someday is going to go in a dumpster, maybe this spring. I've got peas, and I've got corn, and I've got beans, green beans. I've got radishes. I've got onion seed. You know how many onions I harvested last year? Not a one. You know how many peas I got out of my garden last year? Not a single one. You know why? Because I haven't planted a garden for 10 years. And those seeds are sitting on the shelf. And I haven't gotten anything out of my garden because I haven't planted any seed. You want to see some fruit? Start planting the seed. I think all too often we think that the day of the gospel message is ended. I understand we're in the last days. I understand that the society that we live in is getting worse and worse and worse. But it still doesn't negate the command that Jesus gave me. And it still does not stop me from seeing people come to know Jesus as Savior. I'm excited today that I am living in the last days because who knows but what I might share the gospel with the last person to get saved. Wouldn't that be exciting? That as you witness to somebody and they are the last person to get saved and, and, and as you're on your knees before the Lord or you're sitting in a chair next to them and they're praying to trust Jesus as Savior, all of a sudden you look up and say, what happened here? You hear a trumpet blowing and an archangel yelling and you're with Jesus. It's exciting to lead people to Christ. What bothers me about the church today is we do not have a passion for those who are going to hell. I understand we, we relate differently to other people, but fruit bearing is pretty important for Christians. We live in a farming area, so I can relate to you well. Imagine if you had a sow that never produced a litter of pigs. How long would Iowa Select keep a sow like that in their barn? She'd be pork sausage. If you had a cow that never produced a calf, 
a sheep that never produced a lamb. It's not long. And that animal would be down the road. Beloved, we need to be producing Christians. We need to be sharing the gospel. If we are going to be abiding in Christ, Jesus said you will bear fruit, John 15. And we can pass it off any way we want. But if you are not sharing the gospel with people, you are not being obedient to Jesus and you really don't believe that Jesus is coming. I need to realize that everyone I see every day will spend eternity somewhere. Eternity is so long. Yeah, you think 70 years is a long time. Some of you young people say, I think 50 years is a long time. Eternity is so long. And everyone I speak to, everyone will spend somewhere. They'll spend eternity in some place, either with the Lord Jesus in heaven or in punishment in a lake of fire. It's the love of Christ that constrains us. If you love Jesus and you love sinners, then you're going to be sharing the gospel with them. And we'll let God produce the fruit in our lives. Now my job, you know, I, I read the Bible. I used to think it was my job to produce fruit. Not my job. My job is to share the gospel, plant the seed, let it water, do what I can to help it grow, and let God provide the increase. But I know this, the closer I am to the coming of Jesus, I need to be witnessed more fruitfully, which means I need to sow more seed. Third thing, in these last days, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. you believe Jesus is coming soon, you need to exhort one another more fervently. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. That's saying we ought to be in church. And that's a whole nother sermon some other day. Because I want to jump, camp out on that last half of the verse. But we are to be exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. To exhort means to build up one another, to lift up one another. We are to be there to exhort one another. We are to be in church to lift up one another, to encourage one another, to buoy up one another, because here's what's happening in this day and age. Satan is still alive and well on the planet Earth. Satan is still creating havoc on our world. And there are terrible things happening in other believers' lives that needs you and me to come along and slap them on the back and say, hey, I know what you're going through. I'm praying for you and encourage them. And do what we can to encourage them. Shameless plug for Secret Church this year. Every year they play for di pray for a different region. This year we're praying for the heavily Muslim area of Malaysia. Do you realize just being there will encourage peoples who find it illegal to follow Jesus in the country in which they live? What do you do when you're together with believers? Do you exhort them? Do you lift them up? When someone leaves you and they know Jesus, do they feel more blessed having talked to you or do they feel like, oh man, why'd they even bother me? Why don't they just stay away from me? You, you know, there are Christians that are that way, don't you? That when you hang out with them, they make you feel worse. Make you feel bad. It can be a judgmental attitude. It can be a condescending attitude. It can be just a negative attitude. I'll tell you what, negativity doesn't play well with me. Um, I'll tell you, okay, I'm letting, getting off my chest here, okay? I'm going to exhort you. Belly aching doesn't play very well with me either. 
gripe and complain. And I did some of it today. I'm sorry, Carol. I'm talking about my old, tired old sore bones. <laughs> but also realize that when you build one another up, that is what the body of Christ is to be doing. I think too often we're blasting at each other, we're shooting at each other, we're criticizing each other, we're nitpicking each other, when the Bible tells us that we ought to exhort one another. And we're to do it more fervently as we see the coming of Jesus. If we're in the last days, understand it can be, it can be very discouraging for Christians. I know there are a lot of Christians that are discouraged. I know that the world discourages us. All I have to do is turn on the news or click on my news channel. I, I joke in the morning. That, uh, my, my process, I get up in the morning and I turn on my coffee maker, our coffee maker. Then I go and grab my iPad because on it I have my Bible program that I'm reading through the Bible. I sit down, I read through my Bible, read through the book of James at the end of it. Spend a, just a minute or two in prayer. Sometimes I pray before I read. Depends on how things are in the house. Then I get up and make my coffee. Then I will usually remark to my wife, well I guess I got to see who's killing who today. And I click on the news. The news can be very depressing, can it? The fact that we live in the last days and that parents are not the parents they ought to be and that governments are not the governments they ought to be. It gets depressing and that's why you need to build each other up. That's why you need to encourage one another. As the church becomes more and more like the world, we get discouraged. I get discouraged when I see the church and the commitment level of Christian being less and less. And then I realize if Jesus is coming soon, we need to encourage one another. As a young man, I played on a couple different baseball teams. One team that I played on You struck out, they never let you forget about it. Believe me, I could strike out really well with lots of style. If you made an error in the outfield or the infield, good job, Hill. I, I can still hear it. And then they'd rag on you, make sure this inning you catch one, you know. You know how that is. Being the kid on the end when they're, they're picking out teams, you know, I guess we'll take Hill, you know, because everybody else is picked and you're the last one against the fence. I also played on another baseball team. If you made an error, hey, you're going to get him next time. You'll get it next time. You'd, um, you'd strike out. Coach would say, hey, next time you're back, I know you're going to get a hit. Now, at one time in my baseball career, I was so pathetic and I was so short that the um, coach said, crouch down as low as you can to get on base, because I could steal bases. <laughs> Make a little bitty strike zone. <laughs> but you know, the two different teams, one discouraged you. Every time you stepped out on that field, you thought, I'm going to put up with again. The other coach encouraged you to the point where you played as hard as you could play. And you did a whole lot better. So I remember the one time I made a play and, and the coach looked at me and said, I didn't think you had it in you. <laughs> I always did better when a ball would hit me really hard and fast than when it would hit slow. But you know the difference is that when you encourage each other, you do better. And when you discourage each other, you do worse. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, are to encourage one another. The word encourage, exhort, is the Greek word parakaleo. Same word that is used for the Holy Spirit. We are to be the Holy Spirit to one another. Whoa, 
That's a big job. What that means is we are to come alongside and help each other out. Sometimes we do that with physical things. Sometimes we do that with spiritual advice. Sometimes we do it just with prayer. You know, there's some people, I can't do a, a thing for them. Not a blessed thing. But pray for them. I'm learning. It took me a few years to learn this. Rather than say, I, I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you, sister. Here's what, let's pray right now. I've learned that my mind isn't long enough to remember those prayer requests, so I pray for them right then and there. That's why, if I pray for you right, right away, that's why. Because I know I'll forget, and I won't, I'll promise to pray for you, and I won't do it. We are to exhort one another, and sometimes that is just praying for one another. To stand for one another, to genuinely encourage one another. There's enough negativity. There's enough discouragement. There's enough criticism. Let the world do that. You and me. When we interact with each other in this wicked, fallen, sinful world, you and I, let's make sure we encourage each other. Let's make sure we uplift each other. Because the day is coming. That the days will get dark and dreary. And we need that encouragement. I see the body of Christ as a team. A team that doesn't need to be encouraged, but a team that needs to be stirred on to serve Jesus. Beloved, serving Jesus is the greatest bonding agent you can find. Some of you met my friend Terry last night, Terry Davenport. You know why he and I get along so well? Because we serve the Lord Jesus shoulder to shoulder and side by side. I can, I can name off pastor after pastor after pastor that's the same way. Because we serve Jesus together. As the days grow short, we need to exhort each other more fervently. That's what the Bible commands. I need to live more faithfully because Jesus is coming again. I need to witness more fruitfully because my Savior is coming again. I, knew it, I need to exhort other believers more fervently because a trumpet will sound and the archangel will shout and the dead in Christ shall be raised and then we which are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so I need to build one another up. Because Jesus is coming soon. I need to give my life totally to him. Let's pray. Father, we're here today and we want to be what you, you want us to be. To do what you want us to do. We've got lost people that are, are dying without Jesus. Help us to share the gospel with them. We've got saved people that are living for the devil. Help us to pray for them and help us to encourage them. And we've got Christian people that are ready to just quit. Help us to exhort them, to come alongside them and help them. And Father, in it all, help us keep our view of our Savior who's coming soon. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to